Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The verse for our sermon today is taken from Matthew chapter 15. Once again, we are in the New Testament, in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, where we read, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. My brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, Kevin Love plays basketball. What Kevin Love is doing is far more important than playing basketball. He has monsters in the form of emotions that make him feel afraid and hurt him. He ignored those monsters for most of his life because people who struggle with mental illnesses often feel like that's the only thing that they are able to do. He ignored those monsters until one day he no longer could. It was during a timeout at a Cleveland Cavaliers game when Kevin Love bolted from the court and we pick up the story in his own words. I ran back to the locker room. I was running from room to room like, a, like I was looking for something I couldn't find. Really, I just was hoping my heart would stop racing. It was like my body was trying to say to me, you're about to die. I ended up on the floor in the training room, lying on my back, trying to get enough air to breathe. A little while later, a member of the Cavs found him, took him immediately to the hospital, and a whole bunch of tests were run. The tests came back negative. Kevin Love was relieved, played the very next game, and dropped in 32 points. Now, this is where most people would say to leave things. Move on and act as if nothing had happened. But Kevin Love realized that he could no longer ignore those monsters in his life. Kevin Love was no longer in a position where he could just move on and pretend like nothing had happened. So he decided, as he thought about it, that a panic attack was every bit as real as a sprained ankle or a broken hand. And that led him to a deeper commitment, a deeper commitment to begin to confront those monsters that he had in his life. And he knew that not only would he have to confront them, but that he was going to need help to do that. And so he went to a therapist And he said that while the therapist certainly helped him, quote, the biggest lesson wasn't about a therapist. It was about confronting the fact that I needed help. Help bringing his monsters into the light. You see, when a monster is brought into the light, that monster is exposed for what it is, and then ways to defeat that monster can be found. In Kevin Love's case, that monster was found in the form of mental illness. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, one in five U.S. citizens is either struggling with some form of mental illness today or will be in the next 12 months. Now, to put this in in more relatable terms, that would mean that 170 members of Beautiful Savior Lutheran Congregation are either presently struggling with some mental illness or will be during the next 12 months. Let's go back to our text now. Jesus called his disciples to him and said... I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. The Lord had compassion on them. And he had compassion on them because they had empty stomachs. Their 
problem became his problem. And that is exactly what compassion is. Compassion means that the struggle that you may have becomes my struggle. Compassion means that the pain that one of us feels becomes pain that all of us feel. Unfortunately, all too often, though, mental health issues are things that people end up suffering in silence from. And that's because they're very rarely talked about in a public setting. In a recent issue of Christian Counseling Today, uh, the article was The Church, Mental Health, and Suicide. This was brought home. Pastors, 90% of pastors, believe the church has a moral and spiritual responsibility to provide resources and support to those with mental illnesses and their families. Yet, the exact same survey that showed that 90% of pastors think that it is their responsibility to reach out to those who are struggling also revealed that nearly half, 49%, said they rarely or never speak out on the subject to their churches in sermons or large group messages. It should come as no surprise then that people who are struggling in that area in their lives and their families often feel abandoned or neglected. Very helpfully though, the article goes on to discuss ways that the church can offer help for people who are struggling with some form of mental illness. Now in order to make a suggestion, there were two things that had to be true of these people. Number one, they currently had to be struggling with some mental illness. And number two, they had to be active in their church membership. And when they were asked, what is it that your church could do that would be the most help for you personally, these were their five suggestions. Number one, help families find local resources for support in dealing with mental illness. Number two, talk about it openly so that the topic is not so taboo. Number three, improve people's understanding of what mental illness is and what to expect. Four, provide training so people understand mental illness. Finally, number five, increase awareness of how prevalent mental illness is. What I think is so interesting about this list is that in not one case is it a call for a massive new program. What it is is a a very common sense approach. Many of the items on this list are simply a, a matter of communication. It is simply a matter of gathering together as a group, either in church or in Bible class, and beginning to discuss something that once again, statistically, is going to impact 170 of our members. And when you consider the profound impact that a mental illness can have on a person's faith, It is a very common sense thing that something so common is entirely consistent with the outreach of the church and our addressing of it. Now, I don't know how many people with mental health concerns Jesus helped during his ministry. But we do know this about Jesus, that he had compassion on people from all walks of life and in all different areas of life. And just as Jesus did not view people with a struggle as a problem or a burden, 
so also we can use this opportunity to reflect that same compassion that Jesus had for others, including ourselves, to show it to people who have some kind of mental health concern. And our primary motivation is a Christ-like love for souls, a compassionate love that will not shy away from something that maybe we don't understand, a compassionate love for souls that is not going to ignore people who have a struggle that we do not have. A compassionate love for souls that does not dismiss the pain of somebody who goes through a mental struggle as not being real or serious just because it doesn't come up on a CAT scan or an X-ray. A compassionate love for souls that will avoid being like the, the Pharisee and the tax collector who when they saw that man on the side of the road and didn't know what to do, passed by on the other side rather than getting involved. So then the question becomes, if we're not going to do that, if we are going to show the compassion that Jesus has shown to us, just what exactly does a church do? Let's go back to those suggestions. Once again, we have these five. We have number one, help families find local resources for support in dealing with mental illness. At the first mental health awareness seminar that was held in De Pere, uh, a man in the back of the room said that it took him all morning to get up the courage to attempt to try to find help for his problem. He said he had to go through all kinds of ways to psych himself up simply to start the process. With that in mind, what we're going to be doing at Beautiful Savior now is to be publishing lists where you are going to be able to find help. This will be found on our webpage. It will be found on our Facebook page. And if you look at the back of your worship folder for today, you will see mental health resources. There are about, oh, eight of them. Uh, There are phone numbers as well as web pages. And again, if the the number one suggestion was, show me where I can get help, we are in a perfect situation to be able to do this because we do know where the help is found. That doesn't mean we ourselves are going to be doing it, but we can certainly point people to the place where they are going to be able to find that help. Number two, Talk about it openly uh, so it is, so the topic is not so taboo. We need to begin to be comfortable talking openly about the struggles of people who have mental health issues just as we openly talk about the struggles that somebody who has cancer has just as we openly talk about the struggles of someone who has buried a spouse has. Suffering with PTSD is no more shameful than suffering with cancer. Struggling with panic attacks is no more disgraceful than struggling with the death of a spouse. It is part of living in a fallen world. The struggles are different, but the struggles are real. Maybe, for some of you, this is a little uncomfortable to discuss this in the form of a sermon because it's not general sermon-type material. But I think the very fact that we may be uncomfortable discussing it in such a public setting indicates that just maybe my concern that the collective church has in some ways failed to address the needs uh, or the collective church has some way 
failed to address the collective needs of its members is true. During his ministry, Jesus was moved by compassion. He looked and he saw the needs of somebody and then he provided a solution. Maybe the need was temporary. In our text, it was just men and women who had empty stomachs. Maybe it is an eternal need. The need for the forgiveness of sins that can be only found in Jesus. But you know what Jesus never did? With anyone. And that is to dismiss their needs as not being worth his time. You know what Jesus never did? Jesus never overlooked the struggling, but reached out to them once again with that word compassion. My brothers and sisters, that beautiful Savior, you and I have a responsibility to the people in this church, to the people who visit this church, to the people who are part of our community. And that's why we're talking about this. Because we know that there is a solution. And we also know the steps that we can go in order to help. So for the next two weeks after this week, we're going to be addressing two more angles of mental health issues. Next week, we're going to talk about people who know someone who is struggling with a mental health concern. What we can say and what we should never say. And then the week after that, we want to address specifically those who are here who are struggling with some form of mental illness. It is my prayer that we would have that same compassionate nature, that compassionate heart that Jesus had, as we make another's burden our own. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, I would ask that you would lead us as a church family, as a church community, uh, to be open to help people who struggle in whatever area in their life. Make us increasingly sensitive to people who very often uh, attempt to hide their struggles. Make us sensitive to people who very often are ignored because others do not understand how they are struggling. In the end, help us to have that heart of Jesus that we may seek those who hurt, make their hurt our own, and together give you praise and glory for your deliverance. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.